we are nearing the end of our discussion of amplifiers. So, in the next couple of uh, modules, we will first talk about the different designs of amplifiers that are there. And of course, this discussion will be incomplete because really there are many, many designs. If we try to discuss all of those, it will become very boring. So, I will give you an idea of some just to understand that several uh, techniques can be used. And then in the uh, next module, we are going to briefly talk about the amplifier that we have. So, right now we are discussing the different designs and materials that can be used to make oscillators and amplifiers. And as a recap, we have discussed this already. We have discussed two kinds of amplifiers. One is a multipass amplifier in which the seed goes through the gain media multiple times and this is used for very short pulses, no uh, extra EOM or anything is used. So, the pulses can remain short, but the power that you get, the energy that you get per pulse, the extent of amplification is not as much as one can get using a regenerative amplifier. And in the last couple of uh, modules, we have discussed in as much detail as we could without getting into too much of instrumentation, the timing events that are there during regenerative amplification. And this is the uh, one design that we have talked about, the design where the, the gain medium is in a cavity and then the seed is switched in to the cavity by using a lambda by 4 plate. It is kept in the cavity by a combination of the same lambda by 4 plate and a pockel cell and then after the required number of uh, round trips, it is switched outside the cavity, out of the cavity by the second pockel cell. So, two, uh, de design uh, of a regenerative amplifier where we have two pockel cells, but this is not the only possible design, there can be more. This is uh, once again now see in the, uh, this discussion of today, we are going to refer to optics journals very frequently, optics letters and all. So, this is an example of a regenerative amplifier design from 1993. That was the time when all this was being done, even now it is being done, but we will see what is being done today. But whatever design we use now, even that sort of uh, got defined uh, this 20, 25 years ago. So, here you see, here this paper where uh, Moro is there, uh, but Korn is also there. The interesting thing about this paper, I mean there are many interesting things, but one thing I would like to draw your attention to is that this is a collaboration between academia and industry. So, uh, most of the authors including Square who, to whom several designs are ascribed are from University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, but then there is one author who is from Clark MXR Incorporated and that is a company that uh, actually makes and markets lasers. And we will briefly talk about what kind of lasers Clark MXR is focusing on right now. But here this is uh, an early report of an amplifier, repetition rate is still 1 kilohertz and what they had been able to do was they had taken 40 femtosecond pulses as seed. So, I would like to give you the feel of the numbers as well. This 40 femtosecond pulses were stretched to 372 picosecond and then uh, the specification of the grating is also given and it was amplified to uh, 0 0.7 millijoule energy. What is the energy we get out of our amplifier? 4 millijoule. So, this is not really as much as what we get today and after compression, you get 0.35 millijoule, 55 femtosecond transform limited pulses. So, it is not even 0.7 millijoule, 0.7 millijoule is what you get out of the region before it goes into the amplifier. There is always some loss at every stage during stretching, during well during amplification of course, it gets amplified, but maybe not to the extent that you would expect in the ideal case and during compression also some, some loss is there. So, you see before and after amplification, 
0.7 millijoule to 0.35 millijoule. Half the power is actually uh, so before and after compression. After compression, half the power is gone. And if you look at the full width half max of the seed and that of the output, 40 frames per second pulses were put in as seed and you get 55 frames per second pulses. So, not only have you lost energy per pulse a little bit after compression, you have uh, in the entire process you have not been able to get back the entire uh, the, you have not been able to get back to the uh, pulse width that was there in the seed. So, I just like to draw your attention to this because when we do uh, discussion without doing experiments many times uh, we are geared to think of the ideal case scenario, but uh, ideal case scenario is very difficult to achieve there is always some loss or the other. The challenge of course, is to minimize the loss and get to near perfect near ideal situations. So, let me show you the design and here I would like you to I have not animated the whole thing not because it would uh, take a long time, but because now that we have seen uh, all these pulses passing and uh, the polarization getting flipped and all that, I think we should now be able to work out what happens at every stage. So, I will start I will get you started on how it works, but then let us see if we can do the rest of the uh, path together. To start with see what is there I hope everybody can read can you read what is there. So, first of all you have this argon ion laser uh, in 1993 uh, argon ion laser was the state of the art DPSS lasers were just about coming. Uh, mostly people use argon ion laser and even now there are people who work in imaging and all sometimes they prefer argon ion laser because it has very sharp lines, but then it is very difficult to maintain it goes bad you have to change the tube which is very very expensive and then when you have changed it what do you do with that old tube it takes up space in the lab. It is not easy to throw away a laser tube it will burst uh, it is hazardous. So, anyway that argon ion laser was used to pump the Tysephir oscillator output of the oscillator is 30 to 40 frame per second 3 nano joule can you read these numbers 3 nano joule ok. Then it comes here and I have not really read whether the polarization was vertical or horizontal, but to demonstrate the phenomenon I have drawn it to be uh, vertical ok vertical polarization. What is next in line thin film polarizer TFP what would happen when the vertical polarized light goes through the thin film polarizer? No, it is a polarizer it is not a polarization rotator. So, it will go through provided it has a component that is allowed by the polarizer it will not go through if there is no component. So, here the thin film polarizer is set so that it can pass vertically polarized light. So, this is an important thing to uh, understand and remember polarizers so, sort of act as gates they do not rotate the polarization right do not get confused between a polarizer and a pocket cell and today we are going to talk about something else as well ok. After TFB there is a lambda by 2 plate lambda by 2 plate would rotate the polarization by 90 degrees. After that we have something called a Faraday rotator well the name sort of at least the second uh, word is uh, self explanatory it will rotate what will it rotate it will rotate the polarization of uh, the laser ok. And what is a Faraday rotator what is the difference between a Faraday rotator and Pockel cell they use two different effects Pockel cell uses Pockel's effect and Faraday rotator obviously utilizes Faraday effect ok Pockel cell Faraday are names of very eminent scientists. So, we have already discussed Pockel cells where you apply a, an electric field and that causes uh, rotation of polarization in a Faraday rotator you apply a magnetic field you still apply an electric field which causes a magnetic field and it is a magnetic field that causes the rotation right now we do not need to get into the nitty gritty of whether they are interchangeable or whether you want to use this or you want, want to use that uh, right now let us just take it like that there is a magnetic field as long as the power is on like it is now it is going to rotate the polarization and in this case by 90 degrees. So, what happens? 
when the vertically polarized light reaches the thin film polarizer which is set to vertical polarization it will pass through. Then when it goes to lambda by 2 then what happens? It will be rotated by 90 degrees. So, vertical polarization becomes horizontal polarization. Then when it goes to the Faraday rotator it is turned back to vertical polarization. Why we are doing this we will understand in a while. Then what happens is it goes through the uh, thin film polarizer. So, see the design is such that you use the same path until a point and then there is a branching. From the second thin film polarizer that is there the light beam has a choice. It can either go straight and enter the stretcher or it can get reflected and go into the compressor. Okay. That will be determined by the polarization. This thin film polarizer is once again set to vertical. Okay. So, vertical polarization will go through and if it goes through then it goes to the stretcher and gets stretched. However, if this was horizontally polarized it would be reflected by this thin film polarizer and would go into the compressor. That is what happens after amplification. Okay. For now it goes straight and I have not drawn its path all the way to the stretcher, but you can understand it goes in this is a mirror from the mirror it goes to the grating first grating gets dispersed goes to the concave mirror which sort of focuses it on to a second grating plane mirror then retraces its path comes back here and then goes back all the way. Okay. So, here there is an alignment where uh, it is retracing its path and this alignment is actually more difficult than what we have discussed for the uh, amplifier earlier. Because now you have two parameters not only do you have to take care of the beam going in one direction the beam coming back should actually go through the same path. Of course, people working with lasers for them it is not so unusual because when you have a laser you have two mirrors and the gain medium to and fro uh, beams have to have the same path. So, I do not know why, whether that was the reason why it was designed this way, but that this is was what it is in most early uh, amplifiers and maybe even some modern ones because one thing it does is that it can use the same pieces of optics multiple times for doing different things. Okay. So, it comes back and when it comes back it still retains the vertical polarization. So, it will go through yeah. and when it goes through oops sorry that was too fast. When it goes through what will happen thin film polarization uh, polarizer lets it through Faraday rotator is now off. So, Faraday rotator was on at the beginning right, right after the beam passes through it is turned off. So, now it is not going to rotate the polarization anymore. So, if it does not rotate the polarization anymore what will happen at lambda by 2 plate it comes as a vertically polarized light and turns by the polarization is turned by 90 degrees it becomes horizontally polarized. Now, what will happen when the beam retraces its path to this thin film polarizer will it get through? No, because that polarizer as we discussed earlier is set to vertical right. So, now it will come to the thin film polarizer it will be reflected and after this I have not drawn the path. Let us see without the aid of those arrows and donuts if we can figure out what is going on in the rest of the cavity. Okay. So, this is how the beam is stretched and injected into the cavity and we have to remember the polarization now. What is the polarization? Vertical horizontal? Horizontal right. So, horizontally polarized light goes from thin film polarizer, first plane mirror, second plane mirror, thin film polarizer again and then it has to be reflected. So, if it is to be reflected what is the polarization that this TFP allows to go through vertical understood. So, horizontal polarization is going to be reflected into the pockel cell. Okay. Pockel cell is on. So, while coming back 
it will become vertically polarized. So, now it will pass through the thin film polarizer and then it hits this curved mirror which focuses it onto the gain medium through the gain medium onto the high reflector here and this entire uh, arrangement is pumped by a Q switch NDI laser as we had discussed yesterday 100 200 nanosecond pull width of maximum big pulses understood. So, vertical polarization all the way. Now, it does whatever number of trips it has to do and you see there are only 3 mirrors. So, after the required number of trips then this focal cell is turned on again. So, go, go, uh, vertical goes in turns by 45 degrees while coming back turns by 45 degrees again. So, now when it reaches this thin film polarizer once again it is horizontal. So, it will not get through. So, horizontally polarized beam comes back to uh, this thin film polarizer. Okay. What will happen? Does this thin film polarizer allow the uh, horizontally polarized light to go through or does it reflect? This is what we need to remember. Okay. Go back to the, uh, it will reflect right. Remember we started with vertical polarization and that light went through. So, horizontally polarized light will be reflected, turns by 90 degrees. Okay. Now, do we want the Faraday rotator on or off? Because now what is the next step? It should go in this direction, is not it? It should go in this direction into the compressor. So, should we turn the Faraday rotator on or off or should it remain off? Should we turn it on? Should it, should it remain off? Remember what happened the first time? When the Faraday rotator was on, it became vertical once again and passed through this thin film polarizer, went to stretcher. Do you want that to happen? No. So, you do not switch on the Faraday rotator at this stage. So, then what will happen? It will still remain horizontally polarized, hit this thin film polarizer, get reflected into the compressor, gets compressed 55 femto second 350 micro joule pulses come out at the rate of 1 kilohertz. What is it that determines that the repetition rate is 1 kilohertz? Where did the 1 kilohertz come from? Yes, yes. This Q switched NDI laser is operated at 1 kilohertz. So, see the way it works is that you need a timing circuit. A timing circuit is some electronic board that takes input from the YAG laser, from the oscillator and can drive all these uh, focal cell and uh, your Faraday rotator. Okay. So, it is very important to do a precise timing. That is where electronics comes in big time. So, of course, nowadays up to this stage nobody builds an amplifier to be very honest because amplifiers with as short pulse as you want are available in the market, but you might have to fix one. You have an amplifier in your lab, in many places I do not think it is any better abroad, service engineers always take a lot of time to come, does not matter which country you are in, unless maybe you are in Saudi Arabia or some such place. So, sometimes you might be required to fix a laser when you are a postdoc or when you have your own lab. Sometimes in some labs the old homemade oscill oscillators and amplifiers are still working. So, if you happen to land in one such lab in a, in a lab like that you might have to use it. So, it is better that you know. Okay. So, this is the design of a regenerative amplifier with a single EOM, but then when I say single EOM I am cheating a little bit because I am sort of not telling you that there is also a Faraday rotator with that. Great. Next uh, one more design and we will go a little quicker now. I wanted to show this primarily because all this time we were talking about uh, people who are laser physicists or engineers and all. This laser is made, it was built in the lab of a true blue physical chemist Robin Hoxtasser. Okay. And just look at the parameters 18 femtoseconds shorter pulse, 18 femtosecond pulses from a self mode lock tie sapphire laser were amplified to 60 micro joule. So, micro amplification is not so much. 
right of energy at 4.9 kilohertz. So, the laser they used to pump uh, the region had a reputation rate of 4.9 kilohertz with chart pulse amplification in a tie sapphire regenerative system after compression 30 to 35 frame per second near transform limited pulses are obtained. So, once again you see you start with 18 frame per second seed you end up with 30 35 frame per second amplified pulses. So, that is why whenever you uh, get an amplifier you want the uh, oscillator associated with it to have as short pulse width as possible ok right. And this is the design I will not discuss it in uh, more detail, but I encourage you to try and work out the path of the beam in this one yourself let this be a homework ok. And uh, I just like to draw your attention to this fact that here they are using a prism pair to add some uh, more of compression to, to so that uh, the smallest pulse can be obtained. And sometimes even this is not enough you might have to use extra cavity uh, prism pairs ok. Now, let us move to uh, another kind of system all this time we have been talking about titanium sapphire and titanium sapphire alone. So, you might have given the idea that uh, there is nothing in the world other than tie sapphire that with which uh, your ultra fast lasers are made that is not the case. Another material that is used is called alexandrite. Alexandrite is chromium doped BEL 204. The range of tunability range of emission is 700 to 830 nanometer. In fact, I think in 1979 or so the first tunable laser solid state was made using alexandrite. So, it has been there in the market for a long time, but why is it that tie sapphire is so popular alexandrite is not so popular the answer is sort of there in on this slide uh, just see the bottom line. This paper we are discussing by major and co-workers was published in optics express which year which year oh the year is not even there. I think 2012 if I am not much mistaken when the DOI is given uh, 2012 even in 2012 read the first line generation of 170 frame per second pulses at 755 nanometer from a card lens mode dropped alexandrite laser was demonstrated. Output power is 780 milliwatt more or less like what we have in our tsunami actually less than that. And to the best of our knowledge, these are the shortest pulses that have been produced from a mode locked alexandrite laser to date. So, even to go down to 170 frame per second, which is not a big deal with tie sapphire at all, that has been achieved only 3 4 years ago. So, that is why tie sapphire is much more popular, but alexandrite is also used for several reasons. And I want to discuss alexandrite especially because I want to talk about an interesting architecture, but before we go there uh, this is your uh, well since this paper was published in this millennium the uh, figures are in color ok. So, you see even these people like what Hochstresser's group did in 1993 they have used intracavity prism pair. In fact, in the photograph this is the alexandrite rod. And here you can see this prism can't you, you can cannot see the other one, but you can see one. Now, what do you get? This is the spectrum of the pulse. What is the full width half maximum? 3.6 nanometer actually very narrow. It is sort of like our diode lasers and full width half maximum of the pulse well, how much is it? 170 frame per second and that is the best one can do using an alexandrite laser. But think of it this would be an interesting uh, or useful laser if you want to do TCSPC is not it. Spectral width is narrow. The problem with using tie sapphire laser for excitation or doing microscopy is that it is a broadband laser. Many times if your laser is spectrally very narrow you can 
and if it is tunable, then you can excite uh, molecules in different environments. With Tysafire that, uh, I mean, shorter the pulse, that advantage is compromised to a greater extent because spectral uh, spectrum is very wide. Here the spectrum is narrow, so that is actually an advantage. Disadvantage is you cannot go less than 170 frame per second. Okay, so this is the Alexandrite laser, and then I want to show you something interesting here. Then what we'll discuss next couple of minutes is actually a little bit of digression in the sense that it is not ultra fast laser. It's a CW laser, but I still wanted to talk about it because it's an interesting design, and I think that this could perhaps be uh, one of the important designs for future, where one, people might, might be able to make. Uh, ultra fast lasers using that design and you will see why that design is fascinating. So, here this paper is from last year and this is actually a conference proceeding, proceedings of SPIs, SPI uh, has this photonics west conference in San Francisco every year in the month of February, there are several smaller conferences in it. So, this one I think was part of LAS, LASE which is a laser conference. So, there LED pumped alexandrite lasers were demonstrated. So, see until now we have been talking about DPSS pumped lasers, right. If you can use LED, the cost as well as uh, operational issues go down by orders of magnitude, right. And now LEDs are so commonplace, these are LEDs, the light we have in this room, okay. Everybody is familiar with LED, they are everywhere. So, what they had done is they had taken, so th this is the LED right here. I have forgotten the size, I think it is 1 centimeter by 1 centimeter. They had taken LEDs that gave out emission which peaked at 450 nanometer. That emission was concentrated by using something called a luminescent concentrator. I will discuss how it works and these concentrators are very much uh, topic of contemporary research. Only yesterday we had visit by an inorganic chemist who talked a little bit about how he is trying to make concentrators. We will uh, come to that. Now, this concentrator material that is used is cerium YAG and emission of cerium YAG is at 550 nanometer. Emission of LED is peaked at 450 nanometer and it, uh, it overlaps very strongly with the absorption spectrum of uh, cerium YAG which has a maximum at 460 or some, somewhere like that. Then emission of the cerium YAG is at, is, you see very broad emission, 550 or so. And this emission spectrum has a very strong overlap with the absorption spectrum of alexandrite. So, the idea is use an LED, excite cerium YAG, it will emit, somehow concentrate that emission and uh, deliver it to alexandrite. Now, alexandrite can emit, okay. So, we will take a break now and we will come back and we will start our discussion from how a luminescent concentrator works.